Thank you all for coming to Prairie Musings at the Sciences Library. To get started, I'm going to read the land acknowledgement for the University of Iowa. The University of Iowa is located on the homelands of the Chippewa, Iowa, Kickapoo, Menominee, Miami, Missouri, Omaha, Osage, Oto, Ottawa, Ponca, Potawatomi, Sac and Fox, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, three affiliated tribes, Winnebago nations. The following tribal nations, oh, Omaha tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, Ponca tribe of Nebraska, Sac and Fox of the Mississippi and Iowa, and Ho-Chunk, uh, Winnebago tribe of Nebraska nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribal nations and the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, Understanding the historical and current experiences of Native peoples will help inform the work we do collectively as a university to engage in building relationships through academic scholarship, collaborative partnerships, community service, enrollment, and retention efforts acknowledging our past, our present, and future Native nations. So thank you all for coming to the Sciences Library. My name is Lori Neuerberg. I'm one of the Sciences Librarians here. I'll be moderating our panel discussion. And now I'm going to let our speakers, thank you all for coming, introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Stratus Yanakuros, and I direct the Office of Sustainability and the Environment on campus. I'm a Ben Swanson, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science, and I am currently managing uh, 13 students doing research projects out at Ashton Prairie. I'm Andrew Forbes, I'm a professor in uh, the biology department right across the way there, and um, teach a class in entomology and do some entomological research out at the prairie. Hi, I'm Mike Fallon. I'm an adjunct instructor in Earth and Environmental Science Department. And in 2018, along with some other well-intentioned people, I helped um, create what's now being called Ashton Prairie Living Laboratory. Great. The first question that I have for you is that there's a bio blitz happening this Saturday morning. And would you talk about what this is and how people can attend? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, last year we thought it would be fun to organize what's called a bio blitz, where you go to a particular location for some amount of time and you try to document all of the species you can during that, that period of time. We were just going to do it with insects because it was just going to be my lab. We started talking to some other folks and it actually turned into a pretty big event. It poured with rain and we still had 80 or 90 people come last year. There's 260 people signed up for this Saturday, and uh, any of you uh, could come out as well. Uh, just show up between 9 and 12. It's a uh, iNaturalist bio blitz, so you don't, we're not going to catch anything. Uh, well, we'll catch some insects, but we won't um, be um, using professionals to identify most things. We'll be using our iNaturalist apps, taking pictures of things, and either identifying them then or letting the community identify them later. So. It'll be really fun, I think. Yeah, we have um, actually uh, uh, the, the Raptor Center and the folks out in the Fried Natural Area um, are bringing in some raptors. So I know last year they had the American Kestrel and a... Uh, a yeah, some kind of a falcon that they brought. Was it a hair song? It was a hair song. So I don't know what they're going to bring this year, but Dave Conrad's and Ryan Anthony and their whole crew, they're going to have a big tent with their um, you know, there are animals out there. That's great. There's going to be some microscopes set up. So it's kind of a, a way to help the public engage with some of the research Iowa does, some of the things we're into. And, and so it's, it's broad based in that sense and kind of fun. I would add that um, 
for me, it's an opportunity to see community members act as citizen scientists. Um, and the living laboratory is a place in which not just researchers and scholars can do work, but it's a place in which the public can come and learn about um, this mysterious thing called the prairie um, and prairie restorations. So it's a great opportunity for networking and learning about um, uh, environmental restoration that's happening right here on the campus. Um, is it open to all ages, and do you have to register in advance to be able to go to the BioBlitz? My two-year-old's coming, so I think it, you know, and, and, yeah. so I don't know about the upper age limit, but um, my twelve-year-old loved it. Yeah, so we had a lot of kids last year. We had we had people up to you know octogenarians down to, to, to small babies last year, and I think everyone it was, it was I think it was a fantastic. It's event last free, year. and you just register. You, you, it's, it's prefer, we prefer that you register, it keeps telling us, yeah, I mean, at this point, if two more come, what, what, <laughs> we're already, we're already, you know, I have 260 coming, but I think that there's there's a site, uh, Iowa events, if you just Google Ashton Prairie Iowa events, second annual bioclips, or any of those kind of keywords, or the keywords in this talk, essentially, um, on Google, it'll come up and just put your name in, it helps us also to contact you. Uh, in the future if you wanted to be more involved in these events. It helps us to, to, to engage you in that network. But you can just show up too. I think some people showed up last year. The data that we capture on our phones will all be cataloged on iNaturalist. So you'll be able to look at um, what we captured and also become familiar with the tool that if you're walking around your farm or your town or the campus, you can take a picture of something and use this great tool. You, you always wondered what that flower was. It's a great tool for you to be able to do it. It was that. a dandelion. It's more like that. That sounds really fun. My next question for you is that a couple of hundred years ago, the majority of Iowa was covered in prairie, but now prairies make up a slim portion of Iowa's land. Would you share how the Ashton Research Prairie was envisioned and established? And how is it maintained? I'll just do um, really quick to the mic that I'll let someone else answer the rest. But like, what what happened? Why we got to where we are was I started in 2018 at the University of Iowa. And I remember one of the very first conversations I had in October was Mike Fallon and Andrew Forbes showing up with a student whose name was Megan Lentz, and Megan had done a, a class in EES. I'm not sure what got her blood up and she said we need prairie on, on Iowa's campus and I remember sitting in the Capitol Mall where our office to be and we were all at a table and we were like well where can that happen and we sat there looked at maps and things and we talked about doing like a patch by Biology East for a while right outside here like on the inside we're like we can plant like a five by eight foot you know <laughs> we can see something I remember the discussions were like can we go to the other side and could we all in aggregate get like 20 feet of prairie or something and then finally there was a the head of athletics grounds over um, on the west side over there, Tony Senio, who is, should be here today, but we, we call him for a lot of things and he's really busy. He basically was the guy, he was sitting on the sustainability charter committee and Megan did a, like this really great presentation with the committee about why we should have a prayer on campus. Now, following our conversation, Tony was just sitting there quietly and he came back to us and he said, well, I looked around and we have the Ashton Cross Country Field. It's about 20 acres, and you can have that. We were we were all just immediately static, and and that's kind of so. Was Megan wanting to do this as a student, right? That I could scream into the wind all day as an administrator, and no one would hear me. But a student says, "I want this to get done, and things get catalyzed really quickly." And she brought that idea, and Tony stepped up and said. You know, he was a, a quiet observer of these things, but quietly on his farm, at a Quaker farm here in Washington County, and has done a lot for pollinators there, and has quietly done a lot around Carver Hawkeye Arena, and secretly kind of reseeding these areas where he can. Saw this as an opportunity to do a big scale project. So he was our champion, he convinced athletics. They agreed that it would still stay a cross country course, but that grass and weed patch in the middle of it would turn into something more valuable. So we started seeding, we seeded the toe slope, and that's where Mike Fallon got really involved and said, out of all the time and energy as a prairie practitioner, 
and he basically told us how to do it and not fail. And so we turned the whole thing over from scratch, tried it with a one acre test plot. I remember getting the seed mix and deciding what it was, and we put that in, well we, Mike, really orchestrated that with students, put that in, and in the first year, the stuff that came back and popped out, and in the second year, and we said, we've got it, this is working, we've got to expand. So we got a little more money from partners, and we did eight more acres last year. And that's kind of the, the origins of it, I don't know if you have on the, on the 200 uh, year history and prairies and stuff like that, I'm gonna hand up to Ben or Andrew. Go ahead, Ben, Andrew? Aaron? Aaron? <laughs> Aaron? <laughs> you don't worry about prairies anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's true. <laughs> what, what, what I can say is that we have awfully nice soil. I was recently visiting home where my mom's yard is nothing but clay and rocks and thinking what my prairie is like. And it's just amazing soil. And it, the, the pioneers who saw this, once they figured out how rich this soil was, didn't let a square inch go to waste. Yeah. You know, they, it was working in production, and so with the invention of uh, the was the mold board plow by John Deere that was much more effective in, in ripping out the prairie and, and turned it into agriculture. And for a long time, we were growing wheat, um, but thanks to the marvels of corn genetics and and the fact that you can uh, make hybrids that have super high yield, uh, it made no economic sense to grow anything but. Mm -hmm. So here we are. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll add something. Ben, do you want to add something? I'll, I'll add a little bit more. Sorry. I'll add a little bit more to the history part, um, just because I'm more involved on the education and research side, is we saw that this was working or we learned about it and saw an opportunity for undergraduate students to get involved in monitoring and and doing research projects out there that would you know give them an opportunity to learn how to use all kinds of different instruments and um, get some experience getting dirty basically um, so we got uh, Brad Kramer from EES and a list of what 32 people are on that grant um, applied to the university to to get money to basically instrument most of the, the prairie site so that's so we got all the prairie in and it's looking great and then now we've got a group of undergrads two of which are here um, that are that are out doing research to see how that is changing over time and you know, compared to the non-prairie sites and different, you know, high slopes, low slopes, that kind of thing. I remember in 2018, Megan approached me as well. By the way, Megan won't surprise you that she's off on a Fulbright in Norway right Trans now. So, Trans of Norway. Yeah, so she was a hard-charging undergraduate, but she was also deeply frustrated. Um, and she said, you know, we should have a prairie on campus, and I want to try to do that. And so she approached a bunch of people and I think the story is one about good timing as well, in that people were new, people were interested, they wanted to try to sort of build something that was sustainable. The university's talking about sustainability, and a bunch of well-intentioned people got together, and then it sort of um, began to gather a life of its own, and we addressed a few questions that helped it become successful, for example, um, Megan and I, and maybe others, dreamed about the prairie right here on um, the Pentacrest. <laughs> but as a result of teaching, I realized that landscapes have a job to do, and that having a cutting edge landscape, like a prairie, um, in a high traffic area, and arguably a sacrosanct or very special piece of ground the Pentacrest is, um, that that would actually not work because it would attract a lot of attention and a lot of people care about what that place looks like. It's, you know, it's essentially sort of marketing the image of the university. Well, where could we go on campus um, that, could, that had land that was not being utilized or was underutilized or no one really cared about? Um, and, it, and so Ashton turned out to be a great place because 
students can get out there. They don't have to um, travel in a special way. Um, they can go out there and do field work, which turns out to be kind of a DEI question. They don't have to spend extra money and time and resources to go to Colorado. They can go right to the campus. Um, and they can do this great work. Um, and they can do it uh, on a budget. And they can actually flip uh, an area that didn't have much biodiversity or ecological benefits. And they could actually help create something that they want to do, which would be a, the, the elusive sustainable landscape. Um, and so it turned out to be a great opportunity that we kind of stumbled into, but also had good luck, I think. Sounds great. Um, how does the Ashton Research Prairie compare with other types of prairies? And being a newer prairie, how would it compare with longer established prairies? I'll say that it's a brand new <coughs> facility, and there are other prairies like Aaron's that are 25 years old or so. 20. 20 years old. Um, at Luther College, there's one that's 35 year old. At Grinnell, there's one that's, I forget the age of it, but there are various ages, but it's a reconstruction, which means it doesn't approach the level of biodiversity that a, uh, an original prairie or a remnant would have. But when just when you build something new, it has the ability to sort of generate ecological benefits and biodiversity. Um, but it takes maintenance and a nice partnership with Tony Senio and athletics to sort of get it there. I think, I think one thing real quickly is how, how this differs in my mind, and this goes back to, to Ben's point about the research. You know, the history is one part of how we got here and started it. And then when Brad and Ben, and those folks in the ES took notice on the research side, it enabled us unknowing, unknowingly to get a baseline, right? So we're starting from, from really from zero. I mean, we, we, we nuked it. You know, there's no other way to, to restart. It was not a remnant, it was a cornfield. That had before probably been, at, at some point, it was probably tree. It was, it was not a prairie. The soil say that it was a forest, or a savanna, mm -hmm. mixed forest. Or Oak savanna. In fact, Aaron um, performed corn genetic uh, that's experiments. That's right, when I got Back it. In the, you know, yeah, in the 90s. that's right. Yeah. My, my cornfield was there. Yes, <laughs> right. Yes. So, so it's gone through iterations of land use, but it was never a prairie before. It was never a remnant before. But one of the benefits of starting from zero is we have baseline. We understand at day, day zero what the soil carbon and nitrogen balances are. We understand what's not there to a certain extent. And so we monitor year on year and collect data. We have a data set for our students that longitudinally, almost like a long-term ecological research station, can tell us not what's happening now, but in comparison what's what's going in, which is unique to in, in comparison to other prairies, but they might have been there as a remnant or might have been in some state of disrepair, who don't even have a baseline or are doing things. And that's, we hope, in, in that 20-year time period, mm -hmm. we're gonna have this richness of data to say, what happens when you try to reconstruct it? How are we gonna fail? what's good and so Iowa students are going to have a leg up with a very close facility that has this different research quality to it and that's why ours differs I think. Yeah. Aaron were you going to have something? Oh I was just going to say that there's an intermediate between the, the mm -hmm. remnant and the reconstruction and that's mm -hmm. a restoration mm -hmm. and that is something which I think I'm blessed to have is because there up until the 1970s the herbicides that were available were not all that great and so even if a land was tilled there was there's a lot of stuff that survived and then anything that was uh, cultivated after that was nuked and so there you had asked me what were what were things that showed up on mine that, yes. that surprised me I, I drew a blank yes. like Turks cap lilies they're just all over yes. I didn't plant a single seed yeah. I don't know how they survived all yeah. those years but they're yeah. there that's that's one of the fundamentals of, of environmental restoration in this area and maybe elsewhere um, is essentially understanding um, what kind of resiliency is available in the ecosystem you're trying to restore. And it turns out that, that prairie plants have about 60% of their uh, plant structure is root system, whereas trees tend to be about 50 to 50, but they also have specialized root structures. And those root structures uh, allow the prairie to re-sprout even though um, there's been a lot of disruption uh, on the on the surface, so you can 
actually, in, in Aaron's case, she took this old field and spent 20 years restoring it. Now she's getting these very unusual, beautiful plants. And that's amazing to me. Do you want to talk a little well, bit about was, your prairie? Oh, I was <laughs> <laughs> not prepared for that. I will just say that it could be that prairie plants could be special and important and unique and designed to interact with different organisms, but be really boring to look at. And <laughs> that's not the case. So, so we who are engaged in this have the visual treat of getting to see these things come into bloom and just be awestruck awestruck also that, I mean, going back to what got us to here, the idea that those hardworking pioneers could have seen that nothing as nothing but wilderness that needed to be conquered and destroy that, that what seems unavoidably observable beauty. Yeah, there's, a, there's an art history professor here, Johnny Kinsey, who's done a lot of work <coughs> talking about that prairie aesthetic and landscapes and and you know, like the, we like Mike talked about this sort of serendipitous moment in time where we're restoring it, and part of that is the public consciousness that a student would even come up and say like prairie is something we should have is something that's shifted in the American consciousness. The prairie is not like a wasteland, right? For, for hundreds of years, people would go out there and paint these landscapes and talk about the emptiness of them, or in terms of like the need to fill it with something, or the treelessness of them, or like the wasteland of them. Mm -hmm. The Great American Desert, right? That's these grasslands, and now we understand that it's an actual ecosystem. We see the value in a different way, and that has enabled us, I think, to to make the argument to people that they would come up. Two hundred thirty people would come up for a bio and say, "I want to see what the prairie looks like." Is 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 a huge shift in our consciousness that I think is allowing for some of these restorations to occur because. If you went back even 50 years, uh, people weren't talking about prairies in those terms. It was a wind patch. So that's, that's kind of a shift that we've come along a long way uh, in Iowa, is thinking about our, our, our ecosystems differently. We are familiar with many butterflies and bees that live among prairies. What are some of the parasitoid wasps that live in our campus prairie and why are they important to the health of the prairie? I'll take that. I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> the joke is that I study Paris a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been listening to sort of the, the people talk about the diversity of plants, and the way I see the diversity of plants is that every plant is a host to some number of specialized insects that feed on that plant and pollinators too, if it's a flowering plant. Um, but then uh, almost all of those insects, the specialist insects that, that only feed on that one particular plant, are themselves attacked by these parasitic insects, usually wasps, but sometimes parasitic flies, that only lay their eggs into that type of insect. So when you restore a prairie or restore any landscape and you increase the diversity of the native plants, you're also massively increasing the diversity of the native insects, the herb herbivore insects, and also the parasitic insects that attack them. So I see the prairie as uh, like, a, like, a, like a place where diversity is multiplied in, in this really exciting way for, for someone like me who studies tiny little insects. Have you, I didn't really hear the question. I just heard parasitic water. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen um, much? change over the last two years or is it too early? Yeah, or? so uh, I studied particular groups of parasitic wasps, so I would only notice that if, if, if the ones I was studying were in the prairie, which isn't isn't exactly the case, but when we did the bio blitz last year, people were bringing insects over to me and they're like, what is this, what is this? And in several cases, at least one in particular, Someone brought over this really shiny beetle, uh, kind of golden silver color, really, really reflective. And I recognize it as a dogbane beetle. And there's a bunch of dogbane in the prairie. That's why that beetle is there. It's because it feeds only on dogbane. There are a couple of other um, milkweed-associated bugs and beetles in, uh, that are in the prairie 
that are specialized on the specific species of milkweed that are grown in the park. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of lots of things. They, basically, it's a if you plant it, they will come type of deal. And once those plants are there, you get the you get the insects too. I would add that um, really hardly anyone cares about insects. But they're so important to uh, the food web because if you're if you're going to um, transfer energy up through the food web, you're going to start with your primary producers, your plants, and then the next tier are the insects, arguably, and then the tier after that are your birds, and then it keeps um, expanding. So if we're going to uh, environmentally restore ecosystems. And I think we have to appreciate um, all of the tiers of the food web, and we have to sort of nurture them and come to respect them, and not just sort of target and hate like one particular tier and think that we can't exist without it. Well, I, I think that, you know, and, and I, I understand the tongue in cheek comment, right? <laughs> um, but when you see, you know, in this last year, if you, if you get a chance to come out there and see some of these things in our microscope, some of like the, the most fantastical dragons or monsters that we draw um, in, in movies, uh, you know, don't even come close. Don't even come close <laughs> to what some of these tiny insects or parasitic wasps look like under a microscope. Yeah. And I was introduced for the first time in my life last two years ago when Andrew showed me some slides of what his students had captured um, with the malaise trap out there in the prairie over the summer. And you, you just can't be creative enough to imagine these horrific looking, yeah. sometimes, you know, the parasitic wasps, but sometimes just magical looking things like these ethereal creatures, yeah. they're not charismatic because we can't see them. Like if it was a five foot, we would be running. But if it was, you know, if they were bigger, they'd be charismatic. So sometimes it's, it's the scale of prairies yeah. that's interesting, right? You see the Rocky Mountains or you see oceans. The prairie, you have to be on your hands and knees contemplatively like looking yeah. and sometimes have tools that we don't possess with our naked eyes. When you get to that level of understanding, it's, it's pretty biodiverse and pretty magical and that's yeah. what we hope with the tents out there with the microscopes yeah. is that you put under a microscope and see it, you, you never see the prairie the same way because you know that stuff is lurking in there. I think that's a, 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 a benefit of the bioplanes basically. I think the magic is in sort of coming to understand some of the deep time evolution and adaptation that has occurred. And I'll use the monarch caterpillar, which is a fantastic you know, representation of like the thing that we're trying to get back to. And, it, and if you just pay a little attention to the monarch caterpillar, it's ingesting sap that has a heart-stopping chemical in it. But it's learned through time how to uh, nip the leaf in such a way as to let the sap go away from the uh, creature while it's eating, but then, then it can go and eat the leaf. So the adaptation through generations of, uh, of, of monarch butterflies to sort of uh, just focus in on milkweed is spectacular in and of itself. And it's just one tiny amazing story that you can learn by just like looking at this caterpillar and understand what would be an obligate host in a relationship. And uh, for me, that's just like, better than any science fiction novel. I mean, it's amazing. And then, I'm a geologist, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how I feel about deep time. But, uh, <laughs> but mostly, um, recent, <laughs> recent time. Recent time. Um, but I just, like, this morning I had a student out there who was taking pictures. Of, we had like a 10 minute conversation and she had like 30 pictures of bugs, like seven sweat, different species of sweat bee and that, and a bee fly. She and a bee fly. Yeah, it's like, I'm like, this is crazy. This wouldn't have been here really probably three years ago. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it would have been, but I don't think I've so. Seen, I've only seen one bee fly in Iowa before, so that's, that was really cool. So. The, the sweat bees were there when it was a cornfield. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they were. But, uh, just, yeah, jump, I mean, again, things that may have been there before, but just the fact that she just stood there and we're talking and she's just like, yeah, new, something new every single time. Yeah. It's like, whoa. As our, as our resident geologist on the, on the panel, uh, you're bringing up a good point, which is, you know, the biology, the, you know, the, the stuff we're growing on the top, but part of the, the living laboratory is a lot of subsurface stuff that the public can't see. Yeah. And I don't know if you want to take a minute just to explain 
what the heck's going on under the ground out there? <laughs> um, I don't know if it, I can explain it, to be quite <laughs> honest with you. Um, so Dr. Jessica Meyer um, has put in, she's drilled, I don't know, nine holes, 11 holes, something like that, out there um, at different levels, some down to bedrock, um, mostly through wind-blown material, um, a combination of kind of dune sand and silt and lust material, and it's layered, and the data she gets out of it is complicated, which wasn't expected. Mm -hmm. I think it was expected that we would dig through lust and hit bedrock, and that would be it. And it's complicated. It looks like there's some old flood deposits from the Iowa River, and um, or, you know, the, the post-glacial uh, immediately after Iowa River. Um, so it's complicated. So when I say I can't really explain it, I haven't looked at her data enough to know what's going on in the subsurface. But maybe part of the point is we have all these holes and all these cores to look at to, for somebody to figure it out a little bit better. Yeah. Whether it's her or one of her students or somebody else altogether different. And we have um, shallow data now. I just finished putting in, my students just finished putting in, um, soil moisture um, probe, basically. So they can monitor, there's a probe at 10 inches, so kind of the root zone, 20 inches, kind of the lower level of the, of the main root zone, and then about three feet. And we can monitor how fast water infiltrates through those materials. We can see when water, when plants are going to be stressed because there isn't enough water in the system. It can't. Um, there's, the water is holding on so tight to the to the sediment that it can't get that anymore. Um, so then, do the plants just keep going, or do they die, or what? Maybe some on the upper slope they're dying, and on the lower slope where it's wetter they're fine. I mean, all those types of things we now have data for um, that will all be linked eventually into this big geo data base. Um, that'll be available online. So you can go in and you can see what the stream discharge is. So how much water is flowing through the stream, how much water was going through it two days ago when that huge rainstorm hit the morning of the 4th. Um, we have all that data, it's just not in the database yet. Um, you can go click and see what the ground level water levels are doing. Um, in, some, in, one, in two cases, you can see there's the groundwater is divided into like eight sections and you can see what the upper part of the groundwater is doing and the lower part, and they are different, which is not what people That's normally right. think about. Um, there, you can watch what the soil moisture is doing. I, I spent all day on 4th of July watching my, my telemetry data from the soil moisture because we just finished putting it in, and I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> you know, like, I'm watching little lines go up and down, and that's all I was, but it was, I was like, oh, man, that's, then we, my students did that. You remind me of my colleague, um, Richard Baker, Dick Baker, who studied pollen for years and years and years, and he at Coralville found um, uh, subarctic uh, pollen from in Coralville. So the the plant um, uh, communities have changed over time in the last ten thousand years. Project. And <laughs> the point I think is, if you're standing out at APPLL um, at Apple. Um, you can talk about just a myriad of, of topics, um, and whether it be insects, parasitoids, or pollen, or geology, or biodiversity. I, it's, I, I'm super excited by, by the facility. I think the university is going to continue to sort of um, expand it and grow it and come to embrace it. I hope. I mean, and the idea is also to have classes out there. So like my engineering geology class, we go out the first day and we talk about site assessment. And we go out later and we talk about, we measure all the groundwater levels and we build groundwater potentiometric maps, so contours of the water levels. Um, we talk, we go measure stream discharge and we talk about groundwater surface water interaction. So we're using all of those things and I'm sure, you know, I know Mike has a has a prairie restoration class, and he goes out and does plant transects and things. You're using it a lot for both your REU students and your um, and your entomology class. So, really, it's it's not 
just the research, it's kind of trying to bring more people in from, from elsewhere. And I think, you know, this is getting maybe a little off topic, but you mentioned our history professor. We need to start bringing some creative writers and some art. Or work art on uh, part of the other side of, or another Humanities. part of campus to get involved um, and to get, you know, to be more interactive. Yeah. How, how, are we do, how are we doing on time? Pretty good. I have uh, one more question for our panelists, and then I'm going to open it up to questions from you all, the audience. The question is, uh, climate change and declines in biodiversity are some of the great challenges of our time. How does the Ashton Research Prairie help out with sustainability and biodiversity? I think, you know, it's, it's actual value in terms of the footprint, right, being at 10 acres, and even if you, even if you expanded it to 20 acres, is, is less than a teacup in the ocean, probably by comparison. If you think about what was here in Iowa, we've lost, and 99 some percent, 99.9 percent .9 of our prairie has been plowed under, right, side busted. So the attempt is like, yes, there's an impact, right, like we could probably quantify at some point this stays as it is and grows. That it's going to sequester carbon, it's going to clean up our streams, it's going to add biodiversity, but that that stuff is not that's not a game changer, right? What's going to change is that we our mission as a university is to educate students and people, and so to the extent we're successful in doing that, every year a new group of students is going to go out into the world that that didn't have the you know a lot we often heard students would say I want to get into conservation here, so I didn't have that. I wanted to be here and do some of this work. The fact that they can access these databases, see groundwater flow, access the prairie from a perspective that it lines up with their major, the research interests, mm -hmm. I think is what the impact this has is that hopefully hundreds of students a year in some respect are gonna see this prairie, understand it, maybe just the narrative of why it's important, mm -hmm. and then all the way down to really taking soil samples, and then go out and leave the university and have an impact in broader society. Mm -hmm. That's how we're going to impact climate change. That's how we're going to change uh, the world. Is through our researchers, you know, impacting students and then going into the world. When That's I'm how out, I see it. When I'm out there with my students, I tell them a simple story that I hope resonates with them on a basic level. Um, and these are kids that um, maybe grew up on a farm or in a town, and they're not familiar with environmental restoration. And I simply want to convey the marriage of some sort of other facility that's being used for human purpose, let's say recreation in this particular example, or sports. But if we plant a sustainable landscape out there, we marry um, recreation and environmental restoration, we can sort of reduce the amount of pollution that, uh, or impact that we're having locally, because it's an opportunity to talk about a catchment or a watershed in which this material is traveling into these creeks, and then we, then it goes into the Mississippi River, which is one of our most polluted rivers, and we can connect it sort of locally and regionally, um, and then we can broach topics like, well, I know I talked to Aaron about this a number of times, how do we combine farming um, and prairie restoration? Um, and how do we get at you know ethanol and, and prairie restoration or environmental restoration? How do we combine food production and sustainable landscapes. And I think those are the questions students are grappling with and they're hearing about because if you come off the farm and you're proud of food production, well, how do you incorporate prairie restoration or environmental restoration into the farm? How do you do that? And here's a local example of how we've had fits and starts, but we have a successful story to share. That's a great answer, thank you. Open it up to our audience. Do you have any questions? Is there any way you could sneak prairie into where they're growing switchgrass west of the prairie now? Uh, the miscanthus fields? Yeah. That's not switchgrass. So miscanthus, I think if you're referring to miscanthus, it's a, it's a non-native grass and they're using it in the power plant. I know. Yeah. Um, I, Aaron, do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I think that that's, we need, we need 
heat in our hospitals. <laughs> yeah, the short sure answer is no. <laughs> no. And you know, if, if, if it's an efficient use of land, and it's being harvested a couple, you know, every other year, then it's not going to be horribly disruptive to, say, the ground nesting birds who have chosen that as a habitat. Um, and I, I, you know, in the same way, some people look at windmills and they think, oh, they're horrible to look at. And I think, I, it reminds me that we use energy and that seems to be like the least harmful way of collecting energy from the environment. And, you know, so I look at it and rejoice and I think the miscanthus, I, I mean, it's way better than coal. It's better than natural gas. Yeah. We have to find um, unholy or holy compromises. And the whole world's about compromising and sort of, you know, not becoming polarized, but sort of finding some half the middle ground, I think. Now, it would be nice if we could get prairie to a similar size mm -hmm. as the area there. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think our, our priority would be to take over areas that are low quality and, and what did Mike mentioned, like not the Pentacrest, but areas that, that should be low mo or no mo that are currently degraded riparian or degraded prairie, you know, quality and, ecosystems and putting those back into... And Ashton Prairie Cross Country Course has 50 acres of arguably underutilized mm -hmm. land um, that we could combine hopefully recreation and environmental restoration in. So for um, us, we, we know that, like like Mike said, just on that, that site that we are calling Ashen Prairie, if we had the money and the resources, it's not, it's not even the money, because like the seating of the prairie, it costs something, but that's not the, that's not the constraint of the bottleneck. The bottleneck is like just getting that, like Mike being out there on one acre all summer trying to weed whack the heads off of seeds and maintain that. When you send it to eight, you gotta have a tractor. With, you know, and, and then you need to implement, you need the time if you go to 20 or 30, I mean, it just becomes a Herculean task. So we're at a point where we have a footprint that no one would stop us from expanding on. And what we need is more you know, human labor or resources, human capital to go out there. A human capital sounds to humanize it. Volunteers <laughs> or, or professionals to go out there, understand what they're doing, and can try to restore that. And that's, that's our stopping point right now. Is that we have space available that no one's been testing. Uh, but we just can't do it. And I'd rather keep the Miscanthus plot and get rid of parking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very, very low insect diversity in the Miscanthus, though, so <laughs> it could go, in my opinion. <laughs> what is like the timeline for like converting an acre to prairie? Um, and like, what's what goes on? Yeah, let's just pick one starting point. Um, Let's pick the pasture, fallow pasture, the unused land in the middle of Ashton Cross Country Course, because I know that one fairly well. Um, it's low diversity and a lot of uh, pasture species uh, was at one point row cropped. Um, you can, the gold standard is to actually spray it three times to remove off some of the really uh, tough grasses. There are other methods of doing it, um, but if you spray it three times, you set the plants back that are there. Um, and then you come in in the wintertime and you put the seed down and then you have to mow for about two years, but it's a height adjusted mowing and you're just mowing the weed seed heads off. You're not mowing like your lawn because you're trying to tip the scales for a perennial plant. Um, and then year three, you, can, you want to burn it. Unfortunately, Tony has a good reputation and a, and a Knows the fire marshal. Relationship with the, and so this is, this is the year that we hope we burn it. So by year three, you've tipped the scales to a new prairie. And then over time, say at 20 years, you begin to see things like the non-native turf grasses eventually go away. But it's 20 years of work to get there. But at that point, you see some amazing stuff. So it's, we think about it in terms of three, Five, 10, 15, 20 year, 25 year block. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I guess another question of that is where do you source your prairie seeds? Like, mm -hmm. do you get them from Minnesota? Do you get them from other, I guess, uh, warmer this, climates? We actually, it's a Minnesota company yep. uh, called Nursery Moon, or Prairie, Prairie Moon. Prairie, Prairie, Prairie Moon Nursery. Yeah. What, we, what we try to do in this one is um, I've learned through the prairie enthusiasts, the community here, that the gold standard is to try to reference seed that's what we would call biogeographically accurate. 
species that are that would that have been cataloged to occur here in a native or endemic way. Um, and so we can and then I apply several filters. For example, at the cross country course, you don't want twelve foot plants blocking the view of parents that have come to see their kids run around the track. So there's some real world filters you'll apply to it. So we selected plants that are four feet less. Then we looked at the geography um, and we sort of selected plants that did well on a toe slope because the prairie shifts over, my, over just meters. And then we looked for very showy plants because we wanted to put on our hat of an appetizer and like make it look pretty. And so we applied all these filters and then I had my students go to a prairie remnant, a native section of the prairie that hasn't ever been changed and we selected some of the species the plants from that area and then they took them over to the prairie and put there in so we achieved what i thought seeds. the seeds yeah the seeds are no no we never <laughs> dig them up <laughs> they selected the seeds and we put them in but we achieved what i think is kind of like a gold standard or getting a gold star of like planting something that um prairie enthusiasts would sort of say yes you've achieved 50 species of locally grown plant or uh, native plants and and that is not done that often no. and, and that's one pathway Aaron's pathway yeah. would have been different yeah and 25 years or so ago the Department of Transportation had this scheme that they were going to reduce mowing along the highways by restoring prairie and as part of that they contracted with um, people who could bulk up seed and they divided up Iowa into three tiers, uh, the lower, middle, and, and northern tier. And so they, you could buy seed that was yellow tag, which meant that it was, you could know whether it was southern, middle, or northern Iowa that was or, uh, originated. And interestingly, the, the folks who were, who were bulking up the seeds were inmates. Oh. There, there was a prison program that was uh, giving, giving folks some, some plant work to do. Oh, the the take home message for people who aren't familiar with this is that if you buy what's called prairie in a can and the, <laughs> the, the seed comes from say, I don't know, grown in let's say Montana or Wyoming. Well, to use a big word, the genotype, the genes in there of those plants are going to be Montana specific or that climate specific. And typically what happens if you plant that seed here in Iowa, stuff goes away pretty quickly because it's not adapted to Iowa climate, right? And so what we're looking to do is select the correct genotype, but also the genotype of the plants in this area is like a special antique library collection or special collection. It's, geno it's genomes that go back thousands of years. And so you're, you're sort of using those special rare books, if you will, if you're gonna use a library metaphor. And you're sort of trying to preserve that that, it, that history, does that make sense? But the 20 year the twenty year time frame sounds a little more um, disheartening than it is because I remember year two, for me, it sticks in my head when Mike sent a picture, he's like, I see Scarlet Indian paintbrush, right? So like some of these things, even year two, yeah, you get your black eyed Susans and Minarda that are just like, boop, and they're up. But every year now, we have 50 different species in that toe slope that we put in. And every year we go back, we expect something unexpected, expected, but maybe unexpected when you see it, it's gonna pop up. And year two, it was Scarlet Indian Pink Rush. Yeah. Maybe a little early, there it was. And so we're gonna go back this year in July, maybe now, more likely, and you're gonna see things that are just a little newer. Mike's been cataloging and sending us photos. So the, the, in its totality, the prairie's not gonna look mature, but if you're watching, like we are as enthusiasts, things are just popping up. That, that weren't there before that we put in that we want to appear. I think some of the joy is that it is kind of a muse or a teacher, um, and it always surprises, and it's sort of, you make it, you kind of make a special connection to it, um, and it's, I think it's just one of the most beautiful, intimate kind of relationships you can have in a platonic, of course, way. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna marry it. <laughs> The flip side of that is you're never done. You're never done. <laughs> it's always teaching. Which is also sort of like a man. Right. Are there still remnants of agricultural chemicals on that? Of course. Yes. Yeah. We we will have a very good answer for you hopefully in the fall. Because we're 
we're sampling for them. What are you spraying with to kill the non-native grass? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a combination of glyphosate and dicamba maybe. Our groundskeepers are very good at growing lawn and spraying for lawn. He knows exactly how to do that. But we're working with him to sort of tweak his abilities in terms of growing a prairie, which is not a lawn. Um, and a lot of it is volunteer labor that we're just trying to sort of figure out how to create a, a relationship. So, so that stuff, it's not good if you're the sprayer, but it actually breaks down relatively quickly. It's the, it's the past chemicals that are the scary ones because they get stored in those clay particles in the soil. And nobody in Iowa, as far as I can tell, has a good idea of what is going on with them in the subsurface. Um, so uh, that's one of the things we'll look at at the prairie, although I don't think we're gonna see much, but it's also being looked at further afield and um, I know there's already been hits of things like at atrazine um, in places that you wouldn't want to find it. And that's not the daughters, that's the straight up parent and then the daughters that break down products of that are, are also nasty. We have a small environmental chemistry department that I don't have a good relationship with but would love to um, have them investigate. But, but we definitely we're sampling for that at the prairie just to see what we find um, in the fall. I got I have money for a student to work on. This. And we had a, we had a discussion early on about because we our initial ambitions were one acre. We're just going to start there and see what happens, right? I remember and we talked about could we just nail we just buy reams of thick black plastic and cover an acre of black plastic as a way to avoid. And someone would say, you're trying to bring back biodiversity by using a ton of glyphosate. But we kind of did a mini LCA back of the napkin and realized that reams and reams and reams, the amount of plastic that you would have to use, the production of petrochemicals, and what do you do with it afterwards? It was pretty clear. And then the limitations of it, we scaled up, right? When we go from one to eight acres, it's untenable. And so we looked at that, we looked at the project and the attempt, and there's no way to get around brain. And I mean, you don't want to be engaging in that, but for decades, I mean, the stuff they were putting in there was one season of really hard spraying to get our stuff in. But that's also a consideration is that when you mess things up that badly, it's almost like you got to go a little bit deeper, you know, make it worse before you try to reverse and come back. But that's a, it's a challenge. Yeah. Well, we are almost out of time i have one more question which is how can folks uh, who are interested in visiting the prairie or volunteering with the prairie get involved visiting you can drive to ashton cross country course you can take a bus from right here it takes 15 minutes to get there it's right next to the hawkeye lot yep um and so that's and then you can visit the uh, the, Ash, the the website um Google Ashton Prairie Project and the website will pop up. Volunteering, you can get in touch with um, Stratus's office, the Office of Sustainability and Environment. And uh, generally, I mean, if you, if you just want to get involved, I think a great way is to get on our email list because as things evolve, I think opportunities are going are gonna to change. And we're not really, we're all very uncertain how this is going to evolve as a project. So if you want to be involved and we get your email through the BioBlitz, then maybe another opportunity comes up, we'll send something out and then you can hear about it. And that's probably like the best method I have right now because we're not really certain like what this looks like in two years. Yeah, the prairie is not the only thing involved. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you have an hour yeah, uh, uh, this coming Saturday the 9th, anywhere from 9 to noon, just come on out, carpool or ride the bus or um, and then just check it out. Or ride your bike. Or ride your bike. Ride your bike. <laughs> the bike ride is, uh, the bus ride's 15 minutes, the bike ride's 20 minutes from here. Well, great. Thank you so much. Please help me thank our wonderful <laughs>